What's happening, my friends? Read and reflect here. Today, we're going to be talking a little bit about alchemy. And this is something I've begun to bring up on my channel a little bit more recently. And I just want to say, I am by, by no means an authority on, on alchemy. And most of what I have learned about it has come from Jung and Jungians, and while their input I find very, very valuable, I have not gone firsthand into alchemical literature to know what it is, what alchemy is without being Jungified, so to speak. Because as psychologists, uh, the Jungians have to adapt what alchemy is by itself to their theories about the, the development of the individual and certain aspects of his psychology. And so I do have this one book that I got recently. I uh, found this website forum for alchemy on Reddit and this book's by Adam McLean, and he's supposed to give a study course on alchemical symbolism. So that will be basically my gateway for now to getting a first, a direct uh, experience of alchemy without uh, the interruption of psychological interpretation. But with that said, one of my viewers did suggest this book to me and it was just really really good Marie Louise von Franz and this is what I'm saying most of what I've learned about alchemy is from this sort of lens the analytical psychology lens but still uh I almost begin this because in the one book I just showed you, the study course on alchemical symbolism, he was, McLean was saying how a lot of people have adapted alchemy to their own uh, agendas and made it into something it isn't out of a general, a generalized interpretation thing going on without just taking it for what it is. Nonetheless, I totally agree with that, but the things that uh, Von Franz hit on in this book and how she made Jung's psychology quite a quite a bit more intelligible, uh, I thought was supremely valuable, and you can see how many uh, parts I marked so I could return to them. And there's underlines on nearly every page. And it was just all of it so relevant to the things that I in my life have considered. And I wasn't brought up in a particularly religious household. I went to church as a child, sometimes with the family of one of my friends, or a couple actually. And my parents would take me sometimes, but I got older, and that just kind of went away at some point. I stopped going. And uh, I think the trouble is for people coming up nowadays, particularly adolescents and young adults, is that they lack a guiding force. And I've always seen religion to be so perfect in this respect with molding a society for uh with a strong conviction and uh giving them a template for life so that they know sort of their place in it and their proportion and how important it is for them to be moral and upstanding and Ever since the 
scientific worldview has become predominant increasingly. Science has yet to generate any kind of guiding agency such as religion could do. And it's because religions were not afraid to be arbitrary and just say this is because it is. We, you don't have to prove it by studying matter. We just know that the revealed truth is the standard by which all other truths are subservient. And for me, I had a trouble, I had trouble adapting myself to religion and particularly Christianity when I got older. And it's, I'm sure because I'm a child of our secular, secular age and I've cultivated uh, habits of thinking that keep me from being able to just have faith in something that has no basis in my experience. And I totally admit to that. I, I, if I'm talking about absolute truth and reality and the biggest claims we could possibly make, then you're damn right I want to have some perceptible uh, reasons for abiding by such claims. And I, I frankly haven't arrived at many metaphysical, all-encompassing claims. But um, for me, I think the whole work has been rather cultivating an attitude that gets me through life. I mean, any assertions about what reality, reality is and what uh, God wants of us or anything like that, <clears throat> I pushed aside and still I say that, but I do think even just in firsthand experience, there is a sense of commandment and moral duty. And this is why I think authors like von Franz and Jung are important. And <clears throat> Because I think from within there is this voice above the rest of voices which speaks in a way that is very conspicuous. And I've been talking to my friends lately about mystical experiences and they're just so fascinating to me. And I would like to think I actually have them quite frequently, but I think it's because I've sought them out, and I think you can bear a definite relation to whatever that imaginative, fantastic side is to humans, and when you do have some concrete relation to whatever that is, your life seems to go better. At least that's been the case for me. It's only after I started reading these authors did I begin to take fully seriously the fact that I am always in a conversation with what's going on inside of me. And so we all go and live our everyday lives, and in a sense we're on autopilot and just kind of going here and there as we usually do, <clears throat> but then there is this interruption, and it's a an imaginative and I would say visionary state, and I think that people have this in varying quantities and degrees, that some people have very intense visionary type experiences often and they are intense while others i think don't have them quite as intensely 
and not as often either, but still they leave their impression. And I think it's just so natural for us to enter certain states where we're not thinking how we re routinely do, but there's a certain play and openness and interesting things begin to happen in your subjectivity. And this is all so, so fascinating to me, but uh, it seems to be interests to that belong to who many people would consider crazy. But I think it's crazy not to have some relation to your inner world and to want to cultivate it and make it fuller. Because I think that this is requisite to living a, uh, a remarkable bodily life. Because you have this attitude and you have this vision of life that is cultivated and greater because you've wanted that and you've worked on it. And when you do that, it's, I really think it reflects into your personality. It's when you do converse with what Jung and the analytical psychologists call the unconscious, but we could just call it mind. We could even call it instinct and we could just call it uh, the spontaneous things that arise in our inner world. And that is where the conversation begins. <clears throat> and in alchemy, the Jungian interpretation of alchemy as being an individuation process, the first stage they say is the negredo. And this embodies the circumstance of the patient when he's first entering analysis and he's there because he's having neurotic patterns of thought and feeling and he's just getting bad signals coming up and he doesn't know how to deal with them and this is so so many people and this this was me for a long ass time and it still does overcome me sometimes where i'm being attentive to the thoughts and the feelings and everything going on inside of me and yet it's still having its way. I, these things are quite like possessions. Say, if you're depressed or just especially moody, something has taken a person over when they're in that condition. And in the past, we would interpret these as kinds of spirits or something like that. But now... Uh, the popular interpretation is that it's just changes in neurochemistry. And I think it is perhaps both of those things. And if you just pay attention to the feelings, often they come with a kind of fantasy or something like that, an interesting psychic content, so to speak. And that's where you can begin to relate to what people in the past have spiritualized or personified in the instincts. You get in your own fantasy sometimes that same thing, just in a ferocious state, you might get the picture of the satyr or some feeling like you're a satyr and that you get that because it's <clears throat> all the personifications are embodiments of the things that we feel and witness in our mind and i feel like today mythology as a whole is just gone we go backward to look for it and that to me evidences our disconnect with the inner world and our unconscious conversation with it when as conscious beings we should bring consciousness to that conversation because until you become conscious of it you can't really manipulate the trajectory and you're just at the mercy of your nature and your whims 
But if you have, if you become conscious of it and you consciously construe a guiding principle, which in another video I, uh, I mentioned how Goethe and Jung have talked about the entelechy and how this is a kind of guiding principle and this leads onward somehow to Jung's archety archetype of the self and how that is uh, a top-tier psychic authority which advises the ego and the ego consciousness has to have an open ear to it because it sends very real messages and they can I mean, assuming we take the self-archetype to be real, but let's just say the theory works. If we just admit that we can enter frames of mind where there's a kind of wisdom and counsel inside oneself, and it's something wise is told to you by some wise psychic figure, almost. It's There's something that you're not seeing, and it tells you to do something. And it's very, again, conspicuous, and you can't deny it. But <clears throat> since it's just so, it's definitely, for me, been so subtle, while at the same time being very clear, but because it is so subtle as well, it's easy to think you can ignore it, and that you can evade that conversation and not integrate the wisdom and the insights that you come across in solitude. And <clears throat> that to me has always been something like my guiding principle or attitude. And this is why I really identify with the alchemical temper as described by von Franz and Jung is that they did not monopolize any one religion as being totally correct, but Jung specifically, I think it was maybe in memory streams and reflections, was positing the argument that God revealed truth many a time, and we have just merely... Uh, we have been mistaken as to thinking that any one has to be right, and just that various religions have appeared in so many places and have brought them to be civilized and connected and having that inner spiritual conversation. I mean, this to me seems so far the reason for the development of civilizations is that there has been culture, there has been guiding principle and connection to mystery and what we call God and all of that stuff. The big questions were duly addressed and that seems to be vanishing and it seems that now people individually have to find their own guiding principle. And this, again, why I identify with the alchemists as described by the Jungians, is <clears throat> they don't say any one religion is right, but they can all be reduced to this inner conversation, and that's the religious life par excellence. It's that's where you want to uh, place your money. You want to listen to what goes on inside you and acknowledge that there is you, your ego self, I fill in the blank with your name, I'm this guy who goes here and there, but then in you there's a totally bigger and more mysterious self which seems to speak to you. And it can speak to you in this very lucid and spiritual manner with thought or 
insight or something like that, but it can even speak to you instinctively. And a Jungian would say that such a communication would be expre expressed instinctually because there's some blockage up here. And so what wants to be expressed up here in the spiritual faculty is still below. And to finish this video, I just want to read the very last sentence of Von Franz's book, because she states so succinctly what I think Jung was trying to do with his psychology, and I think it's an admirable aim and why I revere him. And it's something that whether a person believes in God or not, I think needs to hear if you can press past even the word God and just get at the deeper meaning of what this, what the, I'm about to say, really, what the significance is of that. <clears throat> so you see the Conjunctio here ends with an incarnation of the divinity. It is God coming down into the human being. That is what Jung has formulated in saying that what is seen from the human angle as being the process of individuation, as seen from the angle of the image of God, is a process of incarnation. So, to put that very bluntly, and this is just my interpretation, and I think it is perhaps the only what Jung was trying to say with his psychology, as is told by his one of his most notable disciples, was that the individual must work at whatever that voice of counsel is inside. That <clears throat> that is the path of Christ and individuation is that by listening to whatever that uh, wisdom is that seems to be accessible to people if they have a certain desire for it. Listening to that is the only way to really uh, to justify the whole endeavor because you have the people who want to gain wisdom, but they don't want to uh, apply it at its best. They just want to be able to say it and sound wise. But that's not real wisdom. It's the making it bodily and being committed to it. That it just becomes your stone, so to speak that when you establish what Jung calls the conjunctio, and this can be variously interpreted, but let's just put it this way, when the ego, self-evident conscious, conscious being that we can see has made an agreement with the self of that same person that we cannot see from the outside, but that's inside, when they have entered an agreement then von Fromm says thereby the philosopher's stone or something like that is produced. And this seems to be this concrete foundation for the personality, something like what a person gets from religious faith. And it's funny because the lapis is described, or the philosopher's stone, lapis philosophorum, that's the Latin term, is described as being a stone, hard, but it's also aqua, it's water, it's flexible, it's adaptable, it's, it's the personality has this new center on which it stands and goes through the world, but it's also water because it can take virtually any attack, but it's also ready to 
I guess, change. And I don't claim to understand this at all. I don't, I know in, on a certain level what the Philosopher's Stone is, but I certainly don't intellectually. And even my saying that I know it in any other way is a bit presumptuous. I think the fecundity of alchemy is that is it is so damn mysterious for everybody. But I think it's a really cool uh, trend that has gone on historically. But to return to this last sentence in the book, he is saying that the individual who listens to that higher counsel or wise figure in himself when it speaks is manifesting the image of God. It's, he's saying God is handing that image or advice to you and that by embodying it in your person and making it real, so it's not just told you and you ignore it and go on doing other needless things, but actually listening to it and making it real. That is what I see to be the alchemical opus. It is the transformation of base metals into gold. And in analytical psycho psychological language, it would be the transformation of the personality from neurotic, possessed, and desperate into something quite a lot more magnificent and appreciable, respectable, and firm. And that has always been unconsciously my fascination and the whole reason why I got into psychology at all is that I could never really give myself to any one religious faith, but I still needed that guidance. And <clears throat> bit by bit, I began to awaken to the fact that it's always been given me, but I just need to peek my ear. And there is a sort of voice that's inside of me, and maybe I'm just crazy, but... I th would like to think it's in more people too, and that you can peek your ear and l really listen to what it says and not ignore it. And when you do, there's this continuity in you. It's you're not really so divided anymore and coiled against yourself and attacking yourself with thoughts and feelings, and it's you're more expressive and free and in your element, I think, bodily and really. So I'm going to go. Thanks for listening, guys.